there's this pleasantly symmetric statement I want to tell you about. There are several proofs of it, but none of them tell what I think is a satisfactory story as to why it's true. It's called Dixon's Identity, and I want to tell you the satisfying story why it's true using the fairly elementary die technique we developed in a previous video. If you haven't seen that, you've got options. I'm going to quickly recap it, or you can follow the link in the description and promise to come back here. Let's sketch the die technique for handling alternating combinatorial sums. In general, we match configurations counted by the sum that have opposite signs, and then count up the leftovers. It's called die because the steps are d, describing what the sum would mean without the minus 1 to the k term and understanding what parity refers to, i, creating a sign-reversing involution to match configurations to ones with opposite parity, and e, counting up the exceptions, that is, where the involution breaks down, paying close attention to the parity of those exceptions. The value of an alternating sum is the number of exceptions times their signs. Now, I should say my memory tells me I'm cribbing my proof here from the great Doran Zeilberger, but the only reference I can find is a link to a media player in Russian that doesn't play its media, at least for me. Other than that, I can't for the life of me find a written reference to this proof anywhere. If somebody's got a link to a paper with this proof, please send it to me. Anyway, before we can attack the theorem, let's lay some groundwork and first talk about trinomial coefficients. Recall the binomial theorem. It says that x plus y to the n is the sum of n choose k times x to the k times y to the n minus k. But rather than calling this a theorem, we could think of it as a definition of the binomial coefficients. n choose k is the coefficient of the x to the k, y to the n minus k term in the expansion. It might even be more natural, if a bit redundant, to write it as n choose k comma n minus k. Similarly, we can define the trinomial coefficient, n choose a comma b comma c, as the coefficient of x to the a, y to the b, z to the c, in x plus y plus z to the n. Following your nose, you'd quickly realize that a plus b plus c must be n for this to make any sense. That explains why we call it a trinomial coefficient, but this way of defining it doesn't give us a great story interpretation to use in bijective proofs, so let's think about it in another way. I often think of the binomial coefficient this way, a plus b choose a as the number of paths from the origin to the point a b taking unit steps in either the x or y directions. That's a plus b total steps, any a of which are in the x direction. That's an a plus b choose a right there. Analogously, a plus b plus c choose a b c is the number of paths from the origin to the point a comma b comma c taking unit steps in the x, y, and z directions pretty reasonable generalization, wouldn't you say? You can even see how this argument can go beyond just three dimensions, but we don't have to do that today. Let's play around with trinomial coefficients to make sure we understand them. What's the sum of n choose a, b, c, where we let the sum go over any possible non-negative values of a, b, and c that sum to n? These are the paths with n steps, but we don't care where we end up as long as we took n steps in the x, y, and z directions. So the first step could be x, or y, or z, three choices. The second step could be x, or y, or z, again, three choices. And it's three choices for each of the n steps. So this sum is 3 to the n. Okay, we're getting the hang of things. Let's review the die technique with a quick example adapting the sum that we just did. We know that without the alternating part, this counts x, y, z step paths of length n. The sign of the path counted is the parity of the number of x steps. If you want to figure out a sign reversing involution on these configurations for yourself, pause quickly because I'm about to tell you one. The involution is to find the first x or y step and toggle it. If it was x, step in the y direction instead. If it was y, go in the x direction. That changes the number of x's by 1, and so it's parity reversing. 
The only exceptions are the paths without any X's or Y's. There's nothing to toggle. There's only one path like that. Go in the Z direction N times in a row. That path has no X steps in it at all, so the parity is minus 1 to the 0, which is positive. So we know the alternating trinomial sum comes out to be exactly 1. By the way, we knew it couldn't be 0 because we've got 3 to the n total paths to match up, and that's an odd number. I feel like we're making some good progress on understanding trinomial coefficients. Let's look at them in one more tortured way, but I promise this leads us to discover Dixon's amazing identity. Let's imagine an n-step path out to a, b, c, but this time let's watch the path projected onto the x, y, y, z, and z, x planes as we take each step. A step in the x direction shows up in both the x, y plane and the z, x plane. The next step in the y appears in x, y, and y, z. When we get to them, steps in the z direction show up in y, z, and z, x. Let's call a configuration where we have a path in the xy plane, another in the yz, and a third in the zx, a triple path. Here's a fun and important note. When we're done, because every step occurs in exactly two planes, we can reconstruct the 3D path from the triple path. Let's try it out. Given this record, look at the first step in each path. Any 3D step leaves its projection on two of the planes, so we can tell that the first step of the 3D path must have been an X, since both XY and ZX planes agree. Let's gray out that step so we know it's done. Once we know that step, we proceed to the next initial triple. Graying out the next step, and the next, until we've gone through the entirety of all three planes. Pretty cool, huh? Anyway, we see that every step is recorded twice, so we have a x's in the xy plane, but also a x's in the zx plane. In total, we have two by's and two cz's, half in each of their respective planes. Okay, we're finally ready to tackle Dixon's identity in full. I promise, if all that triple path discussion makes sense, you can hold the whole proof in your head at once. The left-hand side looks a bit intimidating, but it's an alternating sum, so we know to look for an involution with exceptions. And we can already see that the exceptions are exactly the trinomial coefficients. Along with the discussion of the three planes we just finished talking about, we now have all the clues we need to set this up in a typical die style. Let's examine the left-hand side closely to describe it without paying attention to the alternating part yet. We see that we have a plus b choose a plus k. That feels awful like choosing a path in the xy plane with a plus k x steps. And the third term is c plus a choose c plus k, which is like choosing a path in the zx plane with c plus k z steps. That means it would have c plus a minus c minus k, which is a minus k x steps. This is interesting. Those two conditions combined are saying that we're going to choose a total of 2a steps in the x direction. That's a lot like our earlier tortured counting of triple paths, but this time the x steps needn't be exactly half in one path and half in the other. We have a plus k in the xy plane and a minus k in the zx plane. The pleasant symmetry of the expression means we can repeat the argument for the y steps in the xy and yz planes to get 2b total steps in the y direction. And of course repeat it again to get 2c total steps in the z direction. So the whole left hand side counts triple paths with some basic marginal conditions. That was a lot to keep in our heads at once so let's restate it carefully and clearly. As k varies, the left-hand side counts the number of triple paths, one path that takes a plus b steps in the xy plane with a plus k steps in the x direction, one with b plus c steps in the yz plane with b plus k in the y direction, and a third path with c plus a steps in the zx plane with c plus k in the z direction. 
That's the collection of all triple paths with two A steps in the X direction, two B steps in Y, and two C steps in Z. Phew! That's what's counted by the left-hand side without the minus one to the K. So what does the parity mean? Well, when K is zero, we split our AX steps evenly between the XY and ZX planes. When it's positive, we have more X steps in the XY plane, and when K is negative, there are more X steps in the ZX plane than the XY plane. That means K is the number of excessive X steps we took in the XY plane, or how far we are from balancing our X steps in the two planes where it appears. All right, we have the describe phase done, and we have a hint about the exceptions phase. There's no provision that these triple paths are reconcilable into a single 3D path. It's just triples of 2D paths. Now the hard part, coming up with the sign reversing involution. This is finally the nougaty good piece of the video. Remember how when we investigated the trinomial coefficients, we reconstructed the XYZ path from the projection onto the planes? Well, that's going to be the very way we proceed. Let's look at a quintessential example. Say we have this triple of paths. At the first step of the 3D reconstruction, we see a Z in two of the three planes, so we have a Z step first. Gray that out. Next, we can reconstruct two X steps. Now we have a Y in two of these paths, then another Z. Uh-oh. Now three lists have three different beginnings, X, Y, and Z. No 3D step has this happen. The obstruction to reconstruction could happen in one of two ways, X, Y, Z, or Y, Z, X. That sort of suggests an involution, doesn't it? If we toggle the X, Y, Z obstruction with a Y, Z, X obstruction, we get a new triple path that's still counted by the Dixon sum. Reconstructing the path from the toggled version stops at the same place, so that means we do have an involution. When we switch an XYZ obstruction to a YZX one, we trade an X step in the XY plane path with a Y one, which means the number of X's, hence the value of K, is decreased by one. That happens in both the YZ and ZX planes too, so the involution really is defined on the correct set. Great! K differing by one when we apply the involution means it's indeed parity reversing. So when does the involution not work? What are the exceptions to it? Can one path run out before the others? No. One step direction occurs plus k more times, the other minus k. The one with plus k can't run out before its counterpart in the other plane. Our only hope to construct a failure is for k to equal zero, so all exceptions occur with positive parity. If one path runs out, then they all do, and the reconstruction procedure terminates. Moreover, the reconstruction terminating happens precisely when we recreate a full 3D path with A, X steps, B, Ys, and C, Zs. The exceptions to the involution are counted exactly by the trinomial coefficient A plus B plus C, choose A, B, C. That's the right-hand side, as desired. What a sudden conclusion to our die proof. Rather than challenge problems this time, I challenge you to send good tidings, and maybe a link to this video, to the combinatoricist in your life. <laughs>